Few chapters in the Jewish scriptures have been subject to as much debate as Isaiah 53. It is the chapter that contains the lines famous from Handel's Messiah, He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. It is contentious because Christians maintain that it was a prophecy about the Messiah in general and Jesus in particular, whereas Jews maintain that it has nothing to do with the Messiah and is about the remnant of Israel, that is, the minority of Israelites who remained faithful to God while the others were backsliding recidivists. Secular scholarship has identified three possible interpretations of what Isaiah was talking about. One of these is the Messiah, the second one is the nation of Israel or a pious remnant of it, and the third one is a historical individual who Isaiah knew of. Of these, the remnant of Israel is currently favoured. Judging by his literary output, Isaiah was a highly capable person, but even so, there is absolutely no way he could have predicted the Jesus story around 800 years before it ever appeared on parchment. A less specific reference to the Messiah is possible, however. On the other hand, elaborating on the dire consequences of the backsliding many and the faithful few is on page one of the prophet's handbook. One feature of the Christian argument that is contested by the Jewish camp is that a messianic interpretation of the chapter was the standard one used by Jews in the ancient world, and the Jews changed their interpretation in the Middle Ages to avoid ceding ammunition to the Christian side. That's rather helpful, because whether there were ancient Jews who interpreted Isaiah 53 as being messianic is of importance to the historicity versus mythicism debate. And the evidence for this has been eagerly sought by one side and contested by the other, making it easy for us to find. Jonathan ben Uziel was a 1st century AD rabbi who wrote a Targum, that is, an Aramaic paraphrase of the scriptures to be read in synagogues. In his paraphrase of Isaiah 53, the word Messiah is used to identify the suffering servant who is the subject of the chapter, though strangely all the sufferings are transferred to others, variously Israel, other people or captives. This Targum had its origins in the 1st century BC, so we can say with some confidence that there were Jews who saw Isaiah 53 as messianic prior to and at the time of the supposed life of Jesus. In my videos on the question of the argument from precedent, that is the argument that the Jesus figure was derived from other God figures from around the ancient world, I focus on two things to look for in God's under consideration. One of these was the closeness of the parallels between that God story and Jesus. The other was the circumstantial evidence linking them to the founders of Christianity. Things like whether the gods were worshipped in the same place and at the same time as the founders of Christianity lived. We have a comparable situation with Isaiah 53. It provides a possible alternative source for the Jesus story that does not depend on a historical figure. However, unlike any of the gods I looked at, we are confident that the founders of Christianity were familiar with it. We know it predated the founding of Christianity by hundreds of years. We have good reason to believe that prior to the founding of Christianity, some Jews considered it to be about the Messiah. And ever since the founding of Christianity, Christians have maintained that it was prophesying Jesus. This is strong circumstantial evidence and far better than that involving any of the gods I looked at. So the next question is how strong are the parallels? I'll come to the passage in a minute and there are strong parallels. However, that does not mean Jesus was a myth. It looks highly likely that the Jesus story appearing in the Gospels was made to look like Isaiah 53 and this could be because it was made up from whole cloth or it could be because a historical Jesus narrative was adapted. At issue, therefore, is how much of the Jesus narrative comes from Isaiah 53, and in particular, could the most historicising feature of the narrative, i.e. the crucifixion, have come from Isaiah 53 rather than from a historical event? One final thing before I get to it. As this is a major article of faith for Christians, it is not surprising that Christian Bibles have tended to translate Isaiah 53, often from the Septuagint rather than from the original Hebrew, in a way that favours their belief. This means that if we take the message from a Christian Bible, 
we are likely to find that the parallels we are looking for are artificially close and don't reflect the passage as seen by the founders of Christianity. For that reason, I will use the English version from the Art Scroll Prophets, a translation from Hebrew used by practising Jews. As I'm sure you know, Jews are very deferential towards the name of their God and prefer not to utter or write it, so substitute Hashem, which means the name. One more final thing, and this really is the last. Chapter 53 is the fourth of five songs or poems about the servant of God in Isaiah, and it begins not in chapter 53 verse 1, but chapter 52 verse 13. Behold, my servant will succeed. He will be exalted and will become high and extremely lofty. Just as multitudes were astonished over you, saying, His appearance is too marred to be a man's, and his visage to be human, so will the many nations exclaim about him, and kings will shut their mouths in amazement, for they will see that which had never been told to them, and will perceive things they had never heard. Who would believe what we have heard? For whom has the arm of Hashem been revealed? Formerly, he grew like a sapling or a root from arid ground, and he had neither form nor grandeur. We saw him, but without such visage that we could desire him. He was despised and isolated from men, a man of pains and accustomed to illness. As one from whom we would hide our faces, he was despised, and we had no regard for him. But in truth it was our ills that he bore and our pains that he carried, but we had regarded him diseased, stricken by God and afflicted. He was pained because of our rebellious sins and oppressed through our iniquities. The chastisement upon him was for our benefit, and through his wounds we were healed. We have all strayed like sheep, each of us turning his own way, and Hashem inflicted upon him the iniquity of us all. He was persecuted and afflicted, but he did not open his mouth like a sheep being led to the slaughter, or a ewe that is silenced before her shearers, he did not open his mouth. Now that he has been released from captivity and judgment, who could have imagined such a generation? For he had been removed from the land of the living, an affliction upon them that was my people's sin. He submitted himself to his grave like wicked men, and the wealthy submitted to his execution for committing no crimes and with no deceit in his mouth. Hashem desired to oppress him, and he afflicted him. If his soul would acknowledge guilt, he would see offspring and live long days, and the desire of Hashem would succeed in his hand. He would see the purpose and be satisfied with his soul's distress. With this knowledge, my servant will vindicate the righteous one to multitudes. It is their iniquities that he will carry. Therefore, I will assign him a portion from the multitudes, and he will divide the mighty as spoils, in return for having poured out his soul for death and being counted amongst the wicked, for he bore the sin of the multitude and prayed for the wicked. So, a lot of parallels. 53 verse 2, he grew like a sapling or like a root from the arid ground. Note the parallels with the issues in my video on Philo's Jesus. Verse 3 appears in the King James Version as despised and rejected. Granted, this does not apply to Jesus' biography in general, as he was acclaimed by the masses during his ministry, but it does apply to the Passion narrative. Verses 4 and 5, it was our ills that he bore, a reference to vicarious atonement, that is, atonement on behalf of others. Verse 7, he did not open his mouth, accords with what we are told about Jesus during his trial in the Gospels. Verse 9, he submitted himself to his grave like wicked men, and the wealthy submitted to his execution is a little more convoluted, but it has been argued by Christians that this refers to him being crucified with two criminals and laid in a wealthy man's, that is Joseph of Arimathea's, tomb. But there are also things that don't fit so well. His appearance too marred to be a man? And so will the many nations exclaim about him? And we saw him but without a visage that we could desire him. And if his soul would acknowledge guilt, he would see offspring and live long days and the desire of Hashem would succeed in his hand. That doesn't quite fit as Jesus died young and had no children. 
On the tricky matter of crucifixion, verse 9 says, He submitted himself to his grave like wicked men. Now imagine you were writing the first gospel in the first century with Isaiah in front of you. What would be the first thing that would spring to your mind to demonstrate that Jesus submitted himself to his grave like wicked men? Would it be that he was crucified? Well, you could make a fair case that it would be. So the fit with Isaiah 53 is not perfect, but there are a lot of parallels, too many to dismiss as pure coincidence. And that means that whether or not Jesus actually existed, whoever was writing the first gospel was probably aware of or was using Isaiah. And the crucial matter of crucifixion does seem to follow, and not particularly unnaturally, from Isaiah. So maybe it is feasible that the whole Jesus story was cooked up from this chapter. I'm not saying this argument is compelling, but it's far stronger than any of the other arguments from precedent that I have so far addressed. There is, however, a problem, of course. The crucifixion theme is not stated in the passage. It may not be a great stretch, but it is still an extrapolation. On the other hand, the whole passage is dripping with vicarious atonement, that is, the suffering servant atoning for the sins of others. The problem is that we have good evidence suggesting that vicarious atonement was added to the figure of Jesus by Paul, and further, that it was added to a Jesus who was being followed before Paul's conversion. An obvious corollary of vicarious atonement is the redundancy of the Jewish law. If Jesus died to atone for your sins and make you right with God, why follow the law? And Paul's assertion that Jesus' death superseded the law led to the quarrel between him and his fellow apostles. That implies that the pre-Pauline Jesus was crucified but was not a saviour figure and did not carry vicarious atonement. Paul may himself have got the idea from Isaiah, but wherever he got it from, if he added it to the story, why did the original authors not get the same impression, particularly as vicarious atonement is the most prominent feature of the chapter? What's odd is how this pre-Pauline Jesus could have been extracted from Isaiah 53, including crucifixion, but excluding vicarious atonement. In fact, it's so odd that it suggests the pre-Pauline Jesus was not extracted from Isaiah 53, and must therefore have come from somewhere else, such as a historical figure, and that largely nullifies the argument from Isaiah 53.